Well, it's now October and as you can see before me, the mushroom season in the Netherlands is in full swing. And I couldn't think of a better time to make this special episode of my forest vlog about Dutch mushrooms. So in this episode, I will take you on a tour of some of the most amazing mushrooms that can be found in our country. While this will not be an exhaustive episode detailing each and every species, I will show you some beautiful, beautiful species. And using time-lapse photography, I'll give you a unique perspective on these amazing fruiting bodies of fungi. So please join me for episode 12, Dutch Mushrooms. Well, it's now August, and although it seems a little early to start talking about mushrooms, I've decided to visit this pine forest where a unique group of mushrooms can be found, known as the so-called earth stars. And these earth stars are buff-ball-like fruiting bodies of fungi, so mushrooms. And these mushrooms have a unique morphology in the sense that they open up like flowers. And this is because of the exoperidium and the exoperidium is the outer skin layer of the mushroom and when the fruiting body matures it cracks open forming several slips that kind of resemble the petals of a flower and once these have cracked open they reveal the endoperidium which is the inner sac that holds the spores which kind of look, looks like a puffball and once the exoperidium starts to crack open, it takes a couple of days for this process to complete and to reveal the inner endoperidium. When the rains come, water falls onto the endoperidium, onto the sac which holds the spores, and the spores are pushed out into the, into the air. And that's how these beautiful mushrooms reproduce every year. Well, it's now September and the rains have finally come and the rise of the mushrooms has started. And so too have these stinkhorns emerged recently. I think these have emerged last week. And this is the common stinkhorn, also known as Phallus impudicus. And this is the Latin name of this species, which roughly translates to promiscuous phallus. And of course you can see that this name has been well chosen because of its, well, quite unique morphology. And this, I think, is a specimen of last week when we had some rain. Uh, so two of them appeared out of the ground. So after a period of rain, these stinkhorns can quickly erupt from their witch's eggs using an egg tooth. Water pressure builds up within the egg allowing the stinkhorn to push itself through the leathery outer surface of the egg. And within two hours sometimes, these mushrooms can grow 10 inches or 25 centimeters. And this fast growth is made possible due to hydrostatic pressure, 
but also due to the fact that these unique stink horns are hollow on the inside and on the outside they're porous. Uh, the stem or stipe is made out of a honeycomb like structure allowing the mushroom to greatly expand in a few hours. So that's quite interesting. And over here in the Netherlands we usually find stink horns between summer and fall. Most of them in this area can be found during fall, like right now in September. And when we talk about mushrooms, we only talk about the fruiting bodies of the fungi. Because the majority of the fungal body is actually underneath the ground, it's in the soil. That's where 99.9% .9 of the biomass of a fungus is. That's where it lives, as a so-called mycelium, which is the main body of the fungus. And this mycelium consists of a network of hyphae, or strings. And those hyphae make up the body and take up nutrients from the ground. For example, they break down wood. That's why fungi are mostly called saprotrophs, because they break down dead and decaying organic matter. And that's why these stinkhorns do so well in this forest, due to all the litter, all the leaves, all the dead wood rotting. These fungi love it. So this fruiting body appears from a witch's egg. And this witch's egg usually is produced during summer and then matures uh, during fall. So let's remove this piece of rotting wood. Here we have some mycelium that was growing in the soil. Last year on this exact spot I found dog stinkhorns. And this could be the mycelium of the dog stinkhorn. So let's see if we can find some immature fruiting bodies, some immature eggs of the dog stinkhorn. These are some immature fruiting bodies that may actually be tiny stinkhorn eggs or dog stinkhorn eggs. And these eggs over the course of the next few weeks will mature into fruiting bodies that are about a centimeter or maybe about half an inch in diameter. And maybe at the end of October they will burst open and give rise to dog stinkhorns. And here we can see these thick mycelial strands that will give rise to new stinkhorn eggs. In this case, most likely dog stinkhorn eggs. And if you look closely, you can see that these fruiting bodies are connected to the mycelium via hyphal strands. So the mycelium of the fungus pumps nutrients to the eggs, to the fruiting bodies, making them grow. The dog stinkhorn is the little nephew of the common stinkhorn. And the dog stinkhorn is called this way because the glebe on its cap smells a bit like dog feces or cat feces. But the smell is much more subtle. So the common stinkhorn has this really strong organic ammonia smell. And you can smell it sometimes a hundred yards away. But the dog stinkhorn is much more subtle. And you really have to put your nose close to it in order to smell the gleba. So in this part of the forest there's a lot of litter, a lot of dead leaves. And this is a very nice patch. And often you can find stinkhorns underneath all this litter. So let's check it out. Let's see if we can find some stinkhorns. Underneath these leaves there's a lot of mycelium and you can see the first stinkhorn egg. That's probably a dog stinkhorn. And these are some stinkhorn eggs, probably some dog stinkhorns, maybe even pink stinkhorns, who knows. And you can see the mycelium to which these eggs are connected. And the mycelium runs underneath this litter. Here you can see all this mycelium, all these hyphal strands, which produce these beautiful stinkhorn eggs. Fantastic! So these are eggs of the common stinkhorn. They're a bit small for this species, but since I found stinkhorns nearby, I'm pretty sure that these are common stinkhorns as well. And here is one so-called witch's egg that has just erupted. This morning it was still closed, and now 
it started to break open. So maybe tonight it will open up and tomorrow morning a big stinkhorn 10 inches tall will be standing here. So in the old days, in the Middle Ages for example, they used to refer to these eggs as devil's eggs or witch's eggs. And when people found them on their farm, on their yards, they thought that they were possessed or that somebody put a bad spell upon them. And what makes stinkhorns so fascinating is the way they spread their spores. So on top of each stinkhorn is a head or a cap. And this cap is covered in gleba, which is this olive green, sticky, stinky mass of spores. That's where stinkhorns get their name. And it stinks because the stinkhorn produces a, a chemical cocktail of all sorts of compounds, namely sulfides such as dimethyl sulfide and trimethyl sulfide, but also ammonia compounds. And together these compounds resemble the smell of a dead and decaying animal. And this smell attracts carrion flies, which land on top of the stinkhorn and feed on the gleba. And when they fly away, they carry the spores within their digestive systems. And that's how these stinkhorns reproduce, making use of flies to spread their spores throughout the world. It's quite fascinating. Well, these are some of my favorite mushrooms. This is the shaggy ink cap. And what fascinates me about these mushrooms is the fact that they undergo self-digestion, also known as autolysis. You can see that this mushroom is already starting to break down itself. And when this mushroom matures, it curls up from the base of the mushroom all the way to the top and it does this in a period of one, two, sometimes three days depending on the temperature and when it self digests it dissolves into the ground and black inky droplets fall onto the ground hence its name the shaggy ink cap and why would the mushroom destroy itself? Why would these beautiful mushrooms destroy themselves? Well, the answer, as always with mushrooms, is spore dispersal. By dissolving itself, it releases its spores into the ground. And all around these mushrooms, in a few days, we can see these inky spots, these inky masses of spores. So in contrast to stinkhorns, which use sticky gleba to transfer their spores, these ink caps use an oily substance and animals will walk over this ground and step into this oily tar-like mass and subsequently carry the spores of this shaggy ink cap throughout this forest. So that's another very smart way to reproduce and carry your genes, your spores, all over the forest and the rest of the world. So two days from now, this young one will look similar to that one. It will have grown, but it will also have self-digested all the way to the top. And in the end, all that remains is the stem or stipe, and the fluid will be all over the ground. And when the mushroom is young, like this one, when it's still white, you can actually harvest it and eat it. In Asia, for example, but also in France, these mushrooms, these ink caps, are actually produced commercially for consumption. I've never tasted one of these, but supposedly uh, they are similar to French mushrooms, to your typical French mushroom that you find uh, in the store. And the shaggy ink cap has another interesting aspect to its biology, and that's its ability to feed on nematode worms, which live in the soil. And by feeding on nematode worms, this fungus is able to absorb even more nutrients from the ground, making it able to grow 
in areas that have less nutrients. The shaggy ink cap is a nematophagous fungus. And the worms are not killed by the mushrooms themselves. They're actually killed by the mycelium in the ground. Because the shaggy ink cap has specialized structures on its mycelium that actively kill, absorb, and feed on these nematode worms. Now this is quite a special one. This mushroom is known as the death cap or death angel. The scientific name is Amanita phalloides and it's one of the most toxic mushrooms in the world. If I consume half of this tiny little mushroom, I will most likely die within two weeks. And this is because this mushroom produces a toxin known as alpha amanitin. And alpha amanitin shuts down my liver and kidneys. Within 24 to 48 hours, I'll get very sick. I'll start vomiting, I'll have diarrhea, I will dehydrate. And then, paradoxically, my complaints will slowly go away. I will start feeling better. That's the tricky part with these mushrooms. That's when the toxin starts to attack your liver and kidneys. And within two weeks, people usually go into a coma. They slip into a coma and die, unless they receive a liver transplant. Then, when they receive plenty of fluids, they have about a 50-50 chance of surviving. They consume it, they get sick, they feel a, li a little better, and then they die. Sometimes they receive liver transplants in time, and sometimes they survive. And sadly, every year in Europe and the United States, several fatalities occur because people mistake this mushroom for other species. So if you find a species which looks a bit like this one, it's a bit yellow, greenish, it has a nice smooth cap, it has a little skirt, which is the partial veil, which I will explain in another part of this video in more detail. If it looks like this, and if you're in doubt, just leave it. Do not try to pick it or consume it. It is too much risk and you could die. And these Amanitas are known as mycorrhizal, which means they have formed a symbiosis with trees. And the roots of the trees, which go underground, have fused partially with the mycelium of the fungus that produces this mushroom. Myco means fungus and rhiza means roots. And the roots and the mycelium of the fungus are physically connected. And this connection allows them to share nutrients. The trees provide the fungus with sugars and the fungus provides the trees with minerals. And that's how trees and fungi can feed each other. And this Amanita phalloides is usually found in close proximity to oak. And fly agarics, for example, which is another species of Amanita, that one is often found near birch trees. So in contrast to, for example, stinkhorns, which are separate troves and feed on dead organic matter, these Amanitas really need specific tree species to grow, because they need this mycorrhizal partnership. So this is the false death cap, or Amanita citrina. And this one is often confused with the real death cap, or Amanita phalloides. But this one is also toxic, but this one at least won't kill you. And there are various ways in which you can discriminate between the two species. And the striking difference between the two species are the warts on top of the cap, the false death cap has clear warts on top of its cap. And these warts are remnants of the universal veil. 
which is the envelope which held the young mushroom when it was still underground. The real death cap usually has no remains of the universal veil, so no wards on top of its cap. So the death cap usually has a very smooth cap, while the citrina, the false death cap, has a lot of wards on top of its cap. Here is one false death cap. And here you can see another one growing. So these are known as panny caps or Boletus edulis. And just like the shaggy ink cap, this species is edible. In the Netherlands we call this species squirrel's bread and most Dutch people don't eat it. But in Italy for example, this is quite a popular species for use in pastas or soups. It is dried, it is pickled, it's very difficult to cultivate and it has quite high value. And just like members of the Amanita family, these mushrooms have formed a mycorrhizal relationship with trees, in this case, beech trees. And even though I'm a mushroom enthusiast, I don't pick them from the forest. So I'll leave these here for now. Let's have a look at the anatomy of a typical mushroom. A fully formed fly agaric, for example, has several clear features. First, we have the circular cap, also known as the pileus. Below that, on the stem, or stipe, we often find a ring, or annulus. This skirt-like feature is a remnant of the partial veil, which covers the underside of the cap, bearing the gills and spores. Here we can see the partial veil, forming the ring. When the agaric grows, the cap expands, tearing the partial veil which remains behind around the stem. The cap itself also bears spots, which are remnants of the universal veil, which completely enveloped the young mushroom when it was still in its egg. 
Here you can see the ring forming again. Finally we see the gills or lamellae which hold the spores. Usually, the mushrooms decay within a week after emanating from the ground. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode about Dutch mushrooms. I hope you learned something and that you found it inspiring, as much as I did. I love seeing these unique fruiting bodies rise up every fall here in this country. So please let me know in the comments below what other subjects you would like me to explore in the next episode. For now, thanks for watching.